Call the physical services committee in order. Could you please call the roll? Councillor Van Buren. Here. Councillor Emmons. Here. Councillor McLaughlin. Here. Councillor Gozik. Here. I get a motion to approve the minutes of the August 1st, 2016 committee meeting. Make a motion. Second. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Gozik. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Is there any old business to come before this committee? Seeing none, moving on to new business. Thomas Kells, DPW Commissioner, received a or a pride grant for Franklin Square House. Proposing putting up wreaths and holiday lights in Franklin Square Park for the Christmas season. The funding coming from the Renaissance Fund and the <coughs> lights. Is there anyone here to speak to that? I am. I'm Janet Anderson. I'm a resident of Oswego and I live at uh, 40 West Cayuga Street. And um, I uh, have a, a received a pride grant from the Oswego Renaissance Association to repair the light posts in Franklin Square Park so that we could uh, put up lighted Christmas wreaths, oh, holiday wreaths, I'm sorry. And um, I, there is a, a line item for $2,600 for, uh, for the repair of those light posts. Uh, additionally, I was going to ask for the DPW to be able to install and remove the, the wreaths, uh, in no, put them in in November and take them down in January and um, also storage of the wreaths during the period of time when they're not. Commissioner, uh, is that a possibility? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there any questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll take a motion. Make a motion. Second. Councilor Van Buren. Yes. Councilor Emmons. Yes. Councilor Gozik. Yes. Councilor McLaughlin. Yes. Thank you very much. Great, nice thank job. you. Uh, item number two is an add-on. It is a discussion regarding use of public space for a fall fishing event. I believe Alan and Clark are going to speak to Hi. Uh, sorry about this being an add-on. Um, I'm here as the chair of the Promotion and Tourism Advisory Board. We've been wor working with Brookfield on planning a fishing slash safety event and at this point in time they have asked if we could have it at uh, Veterans Park and we are making it bigger than fishing so people um, not only uh, have safety with fishing but safety in general on the waterfront and uh, I've been talking with Jen Mays from Oswego Expeditions and they're ready to do kayaks uh, during the event and also Ann Backer, um, Dragon Boat Club, uh, is willing to bring the Dragon Boat up uh, for people to use that, and it would all be about safety and waterfront. So um, it's not going to cost us anything. Brookfield is paying for it. Uh, can we do it? September 10th. Any questions or comments? What's the public space that you're requesting to use? Veterans Park. Oh, and there's also going to be pro fisherman Joe Thomas there. And this is for youth. Sure. Commissioner, is the park available that day? Yeah, I'm a counselor, so I don't know. I, this is the first I've heard of this, so uh, I don't know. Hopefully. Uh, Chair, uh, what are the hours of this uh, event? Do we have an idea? No. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really actually been kind of difficult working with this pro fisherman because it's, you know, fishing season and he's kind of all over the place and that's one of the reasons this has taken so long for us to get to you is really pinning him down. So we have him pinned down for that day and we can uh, just use him at will is my understanding. So we didn't pin down a time. You guys want to move it forward, and then we can make some amendments as far as time and that kind of thing. Yeah. On the floor, if you guys are okay. Yeah. Have a motion. Make a motion. Second. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Gozik. Abstain. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. Right. Uh, if you could just touch base with the commissioner, make sure the dates and everything are good, and try and nail down. 
some kind of time frame. Okay. You can be vague, but just stop it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other business to come before this committee? Make motion. None. Second. Councillor Van Buren. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Gozik. Yes. Councillor McLaughlin. Yes. I'd like to open the Administrative Services Committee meeting. I'll please call the roll. Councilor Corradino. Here. Councilor Van Buren. Here. Councilor Reynolds. Here. Councilor Walker. Here. Councilor Emmons. Here. We have a motion to approve the minutes of August 1st, 1st 2016 committee meeting. Make a motion. Second. Second. Councilor Corradino. Yes. Councilor Van Buren. Yes. Councilor Reynolds. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Councilor Emmons. Yes. Uh, under old business, is there any old business? Us. Don't bring up the parking then. Yes. Well, I wonder if there's anything other than that. Anything else? <laughs> Seeing no other old business, uh, there is one topic that we need to uh, bring up. Uh, that's uh, winter parking. I imagine a number of people here are uh, are uh, attending tonight because they want to discuss this. And, and Councillor Emmons is uh, going to be the man who's going to start the discussion. Uh, what we have so far as far as the proposal for uh, this coming season. Also. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I think. Um, <laughs> this has been a long process uh, in terms of working on a parking plan, if you will, and I'd like to start off by thanking uh, Councilor Cordino, Councilor McLaughlin, Councilor Reynolds as well. Um, you know, there's been a, quite a few of us that have been instrumental in having this conversation and trying to advance this conversation forward um, with coming up with some sort of thought around winter parking. Um, I do have something to talk about tonight. I have to caution everybody that this is a work in progress. This is not what would come necessarily to a resolution or to a vote, but I think we wanted to give a sense to the public in terms of what we have been working on. And I think we all realize that there are probably tweaks to what I'm going to present tonight that still need to happen uh, and that there's ongoing conversations. But we do, we have been working on something and, and I will give the public some highlights um, of our work in progress so far. And certainly I think there's opportunities for the public to uh, share their thoughts with us tonight as well. So first and foremost, um, the proposed plan right now there still would be a winter parking ban in effect. Okay? Uh, from November, it would start November 15th. It would end on March 31st. Uh, so that would be the time frame established. Uh, the mayor, at his or her discretion, has the ability to start and end that parking ban <coughs> earlier or to extend it out later, uh, given the circumstances, weather, those sorts of things. So uh, that still is in place. Um, that's still what's on the books currently right now is a parking ban. Uh, during the winter months. However, <clears throat> we are considering the exception to the policy. Um, let me go back. The parking ban would start at 12 a.m. and then at 6 a.m. So uh, historically, it was started at 1 a.m. Uh, we are proposing or thinking about it, moving that parking ban and starting at 12 a.m. instead of 1 a.m. I think it makes, makes some sense on the DPW side of things. Their shift starts at 11. Uh, and so why are we having our DPW folks wait two hours to get on the road uh, for the parking ban? Let's wait an hour. And I think for most folks, you know, whether it's 12 a.m. or 1 a.m., they're probably in bed and have already done whatever they need to do with their car. So I don't think that, that would be, impact folks too much. Uh, for downtown, however, and we have heard this over and over, um, with some of our downtown establishments, the uh, parking ban would start at 2 a.m. So in the commercial district downtown, it would start at 2 a.m. and it would end at 6 a.m. So the DPW would work on the residential parts of the city first, 
and then would figure out you know how to work their way down to the downtown area of the city. Uh, there is an exception that we have been working on um, with this kind of permit permit system. Um, I think it was uh, mentioned in the Pal Times today as well, and I know I personally talked to some folks about it. So I don't know if that's surprising to folks or not that we have been working on a permitting uh, system. Uh, the permit holder, um, the idea of a permit is to really allow a permit holder to park on the street during the parking ban period, so that 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. period. Uh, what we have been discussing at length is, well, who would get a permit? What qualifies for somebody to obtain a permit? Um, we, um, I think, universally agree that not everybody that comes to apply for a permit should get a permit. Um, this is not a free-for-all within the city uh, that anybody and everybody can just park on the street. Uh, that there needs to be some real defined and, and definitions attached to why uh, somebody should and could uh, get a permit. Certainly one of the demonstrated needs that we have focused in on is for residents that do not have a parking or a driveway to park in. So there are a number of houses in the city of Oswego that do not have uh, attainable parking on their actual property. A lot of them are historic homes, but there simply is not a way, even if they wanted to put parking uh, within their uh, property lines, there's really simply not a way for them to do that. So we do recognize there are a number of houses within the city that when we put this parking ban into effect, really do impact, that they simply do not have a place to park unless they went to a municipal lot. We also recognize that there may be other property owners that have an additional special need attached to uh, parking. Uh, that they may actually have a parking spot. There may be only one parking spot. We're not talking about folks that have two or three parking spots, there, but, but there may be certain properties out there that have one parking spot already but do have a second car, and they have a highly specialized need to have that second car available and attached to them. So uh, we're working on trying to craft some language around, you know, you might have a parking lot or a driveway already. You might have enough space for one car. You may absolutely have a highly specialized need to have accessibility to a second vehicle uh, right at your premise. We're working on a policy that may allow a second permit to, or a permit to be uh, afforded to that particular residence. Um, we are working on a fee that would be attached to the permit. Um, right now it's $125 is what we're working on uh, right now. We think that's similar to what the permitting fee is for some of the residents that park in our municipal lots that actually have designated spots within those municipal lots over the winter time. A good example would be um, in the Water Street parking lot. There are specific designated spots within the parking lot for residents of the Canal Commons, condos, and other folks that have um, living arrangements along uh, West First Street for them to have a specific spot to park in. And we believe that permit fee is $125. Uh, we're working on a process for obtaining those permits. It's a combination process of involving both the city councilmen for the ward that they're applying the permit for, uh, the Oswego Police Department, and DPW. There's these three units that do have to come together and, and figure out whether uh, a, a property owner um, should be granted a permit. Uh, the permits would be exclusive. If they, we went to a permitting system, it would be exclusive for that property. Um, it would be a requirement for that uh, property owner to park in or around their property itself. Uh, we may ha end up having a designated spot for that person to park in because when we talk about permits and we talk about winter parking, you know, if we're going to have somebody park on the street, we don't want, do not want that person parking on the street to impact the other properties that are around them. As you probably well know, when somebody's parked on the street, the DPW plow trucks have to go around that person. It creates snow on both sides of that parked vehicle. If there are three houses right in the row and the middle one gets a parking permit, well, that could impede the two houses on either side of that property with snow and cause them some undue you know, uh, complications with their own snow removal. So that would be one of the processes that we would also work through uh, in terms of if a permit was uh, granted, where would that permit be specifically designated for? What is that particular spot? It wouldn't be not a permit that you could go park anywhere in the city, on any city street, on any given time. It would not be curb launched in that way. Um, we would have a time frame for when applications would be available, when applications were to be due back on in. That would probably be middle of October when those applications would be due for the upcoming parking season. 
uh, that would allow for, again, city councilor for that ward, the DPW, and the Oswego Police Department to review all of those applications and make the appropriate determinations uh, moving forward. Uh, permits would have to be, uh, it's a yearly basis for the permit. Um, we're talking about you know, sticker permits and where they would be affixed and within the windows, what makes sense, what, makes, what doesn't make sense, uh, so on and so forth. Um, that's kind of, in a nutshell, what we've been working on um, is that particular system um, in place. There's some other detail, but it's really not, uh, it doesn't really impact our conversation here tonight. But I think we've heard from folks uh, that there, in some sections of the city, there are some needs related to on-street parking. Um, I think I feel comfortable in saying that every counselor has heard from their constituents for a need to have on-street parking, quite frankly. Um, I can speak for myself. I haven't actually received one phone call or one email from a resident of the third ward stating that they wanted uh, some sort of alternative to the, except from what, maybe. But it's, it hasn't been overwhelming uh, in terms of, of this, of uh, the need for alternate street or some sort of hybrid parking model. Uh, but we do recognize that there are certain sections of the, of the city that, uh, or certain residents that may require some sort of alternate uh, to our current overnight ban. So with that, I guess I open the floor up for, especially from the counselors and for the public to, to kind of chime on in on our current level of uh, conversation. Yes? We are trying to solve a short term, we're trying to short, solve a problem in the short term right now and thinking about what the long term solution might be. I do have to say for as, as many folks as, I, and I've done my homework, for as many folks that come to us and say, well this city does this and this city does this and this city has alternate street parking all the time, there's just as many cities out there that actually have overnight parking bans. And so it's a very, it's a much more complex issue than I think people understand in terms of, of balancing safety, really, on our city streets and understanding our geography. Our geography here is not the same as Syracuse. It's really not. Um, we're different cities, we're different makeup, and we get more snow than the city of Syracuse. So sometimes when folks come to us and say, well, this city does this, and sometimes you're comparing apples and oranges in terms of the complexities of what we have. And so we're trying to figure out at least for now, incrementally, you know, we may come back to the table next year and say something worked really well and maybe explore some other options. Uh, the challenge that I think we have and the solution and the, where we've arrived to is that we need to start out small. We've had an overnight parking ban for many, many years. Uh, we tried this alternate street parking fiasco from one to six for a year and a half. I call it a fiasco. Maybe other people don't think that is, but I think it was a fiasco. I could just look out my, on the streets that, <laughs> that are around my house and say it was a fiasco. Um, but we can't, I don't think it would be prudent to move to some sort of big, bold place right off the bat. I think we got to think about this incrementally in terms of, well, we have some residents that don't have parking spaces, that don't have driveways, we may be able to solve that particular problem now. And as we advance the conversation, there may be other things that come to the surface. You know, for example, uh, John, I think you brought up the idea of, of you know, more community-based parking lots uh, in terms of maybe that's at, a, that's at a thought of the future. I don't think those things should be out of the question, but for 2017, 
in terms of what we are for 26 20. Right. And that would be something I think our track advisory committee can start taking on in terms of conversations and so on and so forth. But in terms of what we needed to implement for 2016 and 2017, that's been the focus of our work. Thank you. Um, at this point, uh, we can maybe open it up. Uh, I mean, first of all, we should give the counselor the opportunity. Uh, I know Mr. Clark just spoke, but uh, I'm interested in uh, Councillor uh, Reynolds. Uh, I know from our uh, our uh, analysis of this uh, issue, it seemed like your ward was impacted the most. So I, I really would like to get a feel for what your residents and your ward, even though it's a city-wide problem, I mean, because whatever we decide is going to affect the whole city, but certainly uh, your residents uh, have a, a special stake in this game. Right, absolutely. Um, this is an issue that is big in the first ward. Um, I like this as a starting point because it does give an option for the people who do not have a driveway. Um, and I, I appreciate that we've not, that we've taken the time to, that you guys have taken the time to work on this. And uh, I, at the other side of the coin, I also have a lot of people in the first ward who do not want to go who, who want the parking ban, and this is a good starting point for them, too. So, thank you. Any other counselors? Yeah, just had a couple comments. By and large, I like it, and I'm, I had advocated for you know, a parking ban with permits to begin with. Um, my only, and again, is for discussing it here, because uh, I applaud the work, uh, especially of uh, Councilor Emmons and Cordino, you know, really you know, pulling this together and throwing these ideas at us and um, <clears throat> doing the lion's share of the work preparing this for tonight. Rob promised, or Councilor Cardino promised it would be here tonight. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you put us under the gun. Well, the only thing I was looking at, and I, I did discuss this with the DPW commissioner as well, Commissioner Kells, but um, the two parking permits per house, I think we really need to look at um, the second one being in exceptional circumstances, yeah. for instance. I don't know what it'll be, maybe handicapped or you know some some showing that they really need this because my fear is that it's going to defeat the whole parking ban, and what you're going to find is you might as well have just went to alternate parking um, because the streets are going to be just as congested. And I understand for rentals that you know you could have one per rental, <coughs> or excuse me, two per rentals. But I could see that snowballing out of control as well. One of the quality of life issues and safety issues is I'm having the streets clear. So if we have all these, I know on my block I get three college houses or rentals, that all of a sudden there's six cars and say somebody else needed one because they said, well, we only have one spot. Next thing you know, there's eight cars and the street's packed again and we're back to the square one. So that was the big issue, but there was one other issue I'd just like to throw out there for to hear what other people think about the stickers and um, listening to Chief Decare, the police department, um, and listening to um, Commissioner Cowles. Um, I wasn't sure if this was going to be the best way where police are going to have to wipe the windows off, stop. Um, Commissioner Cowles had presented to me an idea where um, the permit fee would cover signage, and the signage would be permanent, so that way the permit is tied to the property, um, which is going to, again, hopefully facilitate the job of the DPW, knowing where those cars are, expecting them to be there. Um, in addition to that, also, any safety vehicles that need to get down the street, um, an ambulance, fire truck, whatever. Um, so those were the only two things. Otherwise, I really like <clears throat> the way it looks, but I just thought I'd throw that out there for the council or the public um, if they want to chime in on that. Um, I just want to touch on what you said first about the two cars. I think this is set up pretty well that it will not be an issue for cars with six or house, I'm sorry, houses with six cars. It says pretty clearly that um, the first car and then the second as needed if the house only allows for one. Plus, it goes through many different um, avenues. It goes to the alderman, the, I can't find it at the moment. Right, the police and the DPW. Police and DPW. So I don't, I don't think that we're going to get that slippery slope of having 
rental units with the six ounces. Well, to speak on that, in the end there, the, the mayor still has the ability to say everybody off the street at any time if it's starting to overwhelm the, the permit parking to give the DPW time to clean up after a bad storm or something. And then the permit system can go back into effect if it needs to be. The, uh, the one thing that I've got to comment on is I like the thought of the signs. I think it's easier to see a sign than a sticker. You're not gonna, you're not gonna miss it. You're not gonna mess with the car or whatever. But the, uh, the one thing I'm gonna remind you of is I am for everybody off the street to begin with. So. Thank you. Um, in terms of the rentals, I think that's probably one of our was is and continues to be probably one of our more challenging. Uh, topic when we look at, look at the parking plan. I, you know, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's, it was fairly easy for us as, as we moved to thinking about a permit to look at a single family residence and say, you know what, this residence does not have any parking attached to the property. They should probably get a permit. That's where the easiness ended, quite frankly. I mean, that was kind of the, the easiest thing to determine. If once we moved to kind of this idea of permitting. After that, it kind of became this nebulous cloud of what ifs situations. And one of those what ifs were rentals. Um, and uh, in particular, my word, and I know other words, but I, my word in particular, we have a high number of rental units. And I did not want to have a permit policy or an overnight parking policy that really rewarded uh, landowners that were overcrowded within their. Uh, properties to have the ability to park on the street. If you have a property that's only supposed to have four people in it, and you have four spots for those four people, but you're really putting seven or eight in it, I didn't want to have a policy that allowed that property owner to go and get you know three or four permits to park on the street and really reward you know behavior or a violation of, of you know of our code. So I think that's probably something that we still need to work out in some respects how to deal with rental units. There may be rental units out there that have really legitimate issues. Um, but some of that, and I think within all of this conversation, we've been very cognizant of the fact that some of this does fall on the property owners themselves. Um, you know, we're not, um, the city can't solve all of the parking issues. It really can't. Um, if a property owner has six cars on their property, even if they're a single family resident, and they've decided to have six cars, uh, because, you know, mom and dad need one and each of the four kids needs to have one. It's not, I'll be brutally honest, it's not the city's responsibility to provide parking for your other four cars. It's really not. On the city street. Uh, and cause some danger to other property owners around you during the winter months. And so we're trying to find this kind of, really, this, again, this balance between some real identified need uh, and not, you know, making the streets a free-for-all overnight that we have all these cars on the streets and the DPW folks really can't. Uh, plow the streets. The other thing I do want to mention is I personally believe it's not within the construct of our proposed Wendy parking ban, but I do believe, and I've said this to Commissioner Pels over and over again, I think he agrees with me, that our parking problem does not end at 6 a.m., nor does it begin at 12 a.m. We snow, we have snow all day in the city of Oswego. I'm actually a big advocate of alternate street parking between the hours of 6 a.m. and 12 a.m. Uh, every day, because I think that allows the DPW to be able to keep one side of the street clear on a 24-hour continuous cycle, as opposed to letting the streets really build up, um, uh, you know, the snow build up on these streets, and then their, you know, their their problems are confounded really uh, on the overnight. It's not part of the parking permit. I'm hoping that someday we might get to that place, uh, because I do think it would help the DPW out quite a bit on our city streets. Uh, hit upon it uh, in your, um, the end of your uh, comments there. I mean, you're not totally for this plan. You've got some other ideas. However, you're using compromise. Mm -hmm. We're compromising. Absolutely. I mean, and really, what, that's what it comes down to is uh, that no one is going to get what they want uh, with this plan or any plan. And uh, the weather is going to dictate uh, really if this works or any plan really works to any degree of uh, efficiency. Mother Nature is in control of all of us. <laughs> and, uh, 
and uh, I said it to a couple people, I said, uh, whatever we do, if we get a light winter, whatever we do to, uh, before winter, whatever plan we, we pick, and we get a very light winter, we're all going to look like heroes up here. If we have a very tough winter, and the DPW is plowing every day, and, and it snows every day, and, and we get feet and feet of snow, uh, even though the mayor has the opportunity to uh, waive the, um, the uh, alternate parking, it's still going to be a struggle. And it's probably going to look like stupid in some of So with that said, I just want to keep everybody in mind that it's a compromise. We're trying to compromise. We already know, I've lived here long enough where I lived through the, winter, the blizzard of 66. And that wasn't a piece of a walk, a walk in the park. And the blizzard of 77, and the storm of 78, We've had our share of bad winters here, and I know that, as Councillor McLaughlin said, really the best, the best way is to have no parking at all on the street. But I'm willing to compromise and to try this, because we know that the total parking ban works, no doubt. We get the cars off the street and they plow. And we tried the alternate side. Uh, it was maybe it could have been tweaked, but whatever that alternate side parking was, we tried that. That was a, a nightmare. So I see this, and this is only the beginning, it's not the final version, but I see this as a compromise between all or nothing. And that's all we're trying to do here is just come up with something that, that all of us in the city of Oswego can, can live with. You know, uh, we're seeing in the news nowadays people losing their homes because of floods. We're seeing people in California losing their homes and their businesses because of fire. Uh, there's earthquakes. I mean, we've got a pretty nice, if here we are on August 15th talking about winter parking, and that's our <laughs> biggest, biggest natural disaster or issue. So if we can all just try to get along and just try to work this plan and just try it, whether it's this version or a, another version, let's just try it. Let's, let's all pitch in as Oswegonians <coughs> and try to do our best to make it work. And if it doesn't work, then we'll, the council will revisit it and tweak it, uh, modify it. We'll go, we'll scrap it, whatever we have to do, but compromise. That's what I'd like to see by all of us. That's pretty much where I'm at. Anybody else before we open it up to the public? Councilor Walker. Thank you. Personally, I'd like to permit charging the fee because it's going to tell everybody's not going to park in the road because they have a driveway. And it's going to go through two different department heads and the councilor. So they're not just going to park in the road and not say, hey, I shovel my driveway, I'll park in the road. That's where we were getting in our problems before because it was open to everybody. And they were just, I hate to say it, some of them were just too lazy to shovel their own driveway. And it was hurting their neighbors and hurting other people around because the plows were just dumping on them. Other people had to shovel twice a day and people were getting irritated with it. And everybody was just saying, forget it, I'm not shoveling no more. And I think with the charging of it, <laughs> Just one final comment um, in the follow-up on Council Walker's comment. Um, some might be asking, you know, why aren't we just going to an alternate street policy? And uh, I will speak from my own um, experience. Um, I do deliveries once a week to the city of Syracuse and drive through many of those neighborhood streets. And I got to be honest with you, there are quite a few folks who do, that do not plow their driveway in Syracuse and elect to park on the city streets. I see them. I have to drive through that uh, in many times. And sometimes there's people parked on both sides of the street when they shouldn't be. And, and those streets become a one-way street. And if you're caught going the opposite way, you're kind of stuck and people have to back out and turn around and do those sorts of things. I've experienced that. And so to simply say, let's go to alternate and people follow those, that rule and be good neighbors and plow their driveways because they have parking you just do that unfortunately sometimes that's not human behavior um, and we have to deal with human behavior and, um, and I've seen it firsthand so as I said before and I think where we've come to is this kind of incremental step of well let's try something out simplistically as simplistically as we can get uh, and see how it works out at this point I'd like to open it up I know mr. Clark already uh, did have uh, his say but uh, is there anybody else that would like to uh, uh, say something, and if they do, I'd like to have them come up to the podium so they can be heard and uh, public record uh, on the uh, on the audio portion of our uh, video. Is there anybody that would like to talk about this, or did I scare them all? <laughs> Mr. Clark. 
Clark, you were the only one. Oh, maybe not. I gotta lower this because of my height. Hello, I just have one concern. Uh, I live on West 8th Street and we have, um, in the first ward, and we have several rentals on our property, on our street. We have three rentals and a possible four. But my concern is we have a house right across the street that's a rental. They have two spaces to park. And it's been in the past that a lot of times, rather than them parking in the driveway, they'll park on the street because they don't want to move the car. You know, it's, sometimes it's hard, difficult to move the cars around. But my also, my also concern is, let's say you've got the two cars that have got their stickers. So what happens, you know, with different people, they have different schedules. So let's say you've got those two cars that have the stickers and they're not going to be there. So how are, how are, you, going to, how are you going to resolve that? situation. Well, I'm going back to uh, how did we resolve it uh, when uh, for years we had a parking ban? People made out. I mean, I grew up uh, on the west side and there were a number of houses that had no parking. And they would ask the person down the street, can I park in your driveway? Mm -hmm. We all got along and we all did what we had to do. You know, in that scenario that you just uh, described, uh, so you have, uh, you have two cars and one parking space, is that what you're saying? Or you have two well, there's four cars four and cars. Only two well, parking spaces. Again, as Councilor Emmons pointed out, that we're not here to solve everybody's right. problem. And uh, in that scenario, if somebody had a permit to park on the road, they could park on the road. Anybody else would have to find alternate parking, whether it's the driveway they have or wherever else they could find it. Again, we're not here to solve everybody's uh, parking issue. We're here to try to help people right. uh, to the best of our ability. But you can run down about 20 different scenarios we did on this committee right. on one car, two cars, one parking space, no parking space. Uh, it just that you could you can conceivably talk about this for hours about different scenarios. Right. And the way we're talking about it is there would be a parking ban, totally. And then you could only park on the road if you had a permit. And you have to go through the process, the application, to get a permit, which I would hope would be, you know, have high standards and go by certain guidelines. You know, we're not going to pass them out just because they're friends with Councilor Emmons or, or Councilor McLaughlin. I mean, because there's going to be the police chief and the uh, um, DPW commissioner and the councilor. So favoritism shouldn't have come into play here, all right? Uh, it should be done fairly. So I don't know if I answered your question, uh, but I'm just saying this is a work in progress also. Now, if someone, let's say, if it's a rental area in... This year, there's only three college students that have cars. So would you still issue that um, property two parking pads, or would just the, I mean, two parking spaces, or like just the one? If that. They would have to apply. They would have to be in front of the committee, and they could get one. And again, we were discussing how there could be special circumstances for a second one. One, I don't want to say would be an automatic, but you still have to show need, no parking, for example. Again, those guidelines, you know, the purpose of this meeting was to basically uh, show the bones of this proposal and we could flesh it out and put some meat on it. Right. But having input from you and everybody else who wanted to was important today. And, and we've got this on the agenda here as a discussion. Right. So uh, that's what, what we're doing here and we're, we're uh, still in the process of, of uh, coming up with the, the exact guidelines main part of it. I have one other question. Sure. Um, so let's say there's so many kids now that are leaving uh, the area, they're going elsewhere for jobs. They come home for a holiday and let's say you've got five kids or four kids in all these cars. So how would, would they have to get a permit to park in a... You would park in a municipal lot. Okay. Yes. Because as it's written right now, they would have to apply for a permit uh, and there's a certain uh, uh, time limit talked about uh, going from uh, June 1st uh, to uh, October 15th. So if you, didn't have a, if you didn't apply for a permit by the 15th of October, you're not going to have one. And if you have one, it's because you were qualified. So again, I mean, we, we can talk all night about different scenarios. I really could. Thank you. Counselor, if I may, uh, just to address the, lady, the young lady's earlier question about uh, college students, I think the other thing that uh, we've talked about is uh, somehow partnering with uh, Junia Oswego and getting information to um, 
off street or uh, off campus residents about the value of taking their vehicles home over Thanksgiving break and leaving them there um, and not bringing them back until after spring break. Um, the, all, the other alternative for them really is, and it's brand new up there, they got a nice flat, no pothole Romney parking lot now. Um, and students can get really cheap parking permits to park in Romney all winter long and access public transportation on Central. That would be the other thing I would encourage college students to do is to take advantage of those two options as opposed to trying to make their way to figure out how to park on city streets or, or not. In this particular case, with I think a pretty stringent permit policy in place. Yes. Hi. I live in the fourth ward, and you've heard me speak before. And I just want to thank you. The plan you've laid out seems like a good starting point. Um, I have the opposite question, though, about college kids. My college kid lives in Plattsburgh, comes home for Thanksgiving. Will he be able to just go park in a municipal lot, or will we have to have a separate process for that? I think there's no permits right now for the municipal lots. I mean, it's a first come, first serve for the designated lots, so they could certainly park down there. And the same holds true for anybody that has additional cars within their family, whether it's year long or at certain times of the year, those lots, that, those lots would be made available. And obviously, folks would just have to kind of shuttle back and forth, if you will. Right, you right. Know. That that makes sense. My initial suggestion to you was a limit of two slots per household, even though I know sometimes I need three. Two should be enough. Um, and then in the event of a full ban, if we get you know big snow, can we just assume that we can go and park in the municipal lots then? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. I live in the third ward, and my question comes as far as the college students, the rental properties, let's go with that one. Um, as it is, it states here that it, you'd have to demonstrate need for it. Um, you're talking people who don't have a driveway or only have parking for one car. As it is in the city code 280-52, one and two family dwellings need to have two parking spaces as it is and multiple, three or more, have to have five parking spaces. So they would have up to two additional, besides the two they have in the driveway, or the five that they have? Is that what you're saying? No. Because they're already, they already required to have two. If they have a rental property, they're already required to have two. So. It always has to be, there, there, there's not ever an automatic within the permitting policy. Mm -hmm. Not. It all has to undercome, right. uh, undergo review. If you have five cars and you have five spots, you have those five spots that you park in. You don't get automatically a permit or two to park on the street. Okay. So, because yeah. uh, we there's, mainly there's started out as people that don't have parking places or only have enough parking for one car, we're going to give exceptions, you know, permits for people yeah, I mean, for two some, or a third. But we already have rental properties that are required to have at least two parking spots. Five if they have three or more rentals. Right, and, and we have so. been very cognizant of our code. I mean, we have been trying to um, ensure that we are a, not violating our code or B, uh, allowing um, current landowners that are violating the code mm -hmm. to continue to violate the code. Yeah. Well. But we have some realities that we deal with in, this, in the city. There are, there are some places that have, you know, potentially room for two parking spots, and maybe mm -hmm. theoretically they do, but they're covering up the sidewalk in the process. Yes. Um, and you know, so there's the, some of those balancing acts that we are going to have to go through, permit by permit, to really kind of weed this out. I think part of our thinking is that we go through it this year. It's probably going to be the most difficult year, mm -hmm. quite frankly, because you know, honestly, I think a lot of folks would, depending on the permitting process, a lot of folks may apply to try to get a permit, and we're going to need to weed through all of those in this first year. But if you get denied this first year and you come back and it's the same circumstance, circumstances for the next year. It's not going to change from year to year okay. uh, in terms of uh, the... the but I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that rental properties are required to have at least two for one yeah. or two and five for three or more. And there's some challenges there. I know many, um, many properties that have parking, but they do cover up the sidewalk. And so mm -hmm. there, there's, there's some ancillary issues that I think we need to start working with, which is why we have, a, I think, a well-operating codes office now and 
hopefully some improvements in that area moving forward because those are the type. There's a lot of these things that kind of work hand in hand. You, you know, you can have a parking permit policy, but there's, then there's some code related issues that also need to be worked on that impact oh, that know. parking permit. And then one of the things that we've talked about is snow removal in the sidewalk. That impacts the quality of life in yeah. the city streets within the winter too. There's a lot of things that kind of make up this this puzzle, we focused on one piece of the puzzle. There's other things that also need some work on as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, hey guys. Um, I just want to say thanks for the work you guys did on it. I appreciate it. And I just had one suggestion, which was for those that don't have any parking whatsoever and uh, that they should be maybe forgiven the fee on the first permit. And because we shouldn't be penalized for not having parking when other people do. But anyone else who's looking for that additional, or if you have one parking space or no parking space and you have two cars, then pay for the second permit. Just a suggestion. Thank you. How you guys doing? Doing I'm good. Good. Uh, I'm Jesse from West 4th Street. This is all new to me. Never actually went to one of these meetings. Um, I think the big thing with me was I'm a homeowner. I've been here for two years, and this is my first time I went to this meeting. So I didn't know about any of the uh, parking ban last year, and I think something has to come out to like the homeowners personally, you know, to like an actual mailing to their actual address. Um, I kind of just found out from other people. So at the same time, I think everyone should be aware about it. I think that's my suggestion on that. No, I feel like you know, just something in the mailbox, letting all homeowners know about the whole situation. That's what I think. Um, and then, what I thought, I guess you can't have overnight guests. It sounds like I, the holidays around the corner after November. So for Thanksgiving and Christmas, New Year's, you can't have overnight guests. That's what I was thinking about. Um, it also increases drunk driving. If you uh, don't let people drive overnight, you can't, can't park your car overnight, so you, you're increasing the DWIs. Especially amongst college students, you're going to have a lot more accidents, it seems like. Yeah, I mean, I think these are all issues that talked about it, you know, with, with holiday guests and overnight guests and so on and so forth. Yeah, I, I think we've always kind of landed back at this place too that uh, there's been a solution, if you will, in place for many, many years. It's been called an overnight parking ban. And folks have had to adjust to that overnight parking ban for many, many years and have had to deal with these issues for many, many years. And so, you know, we've tried to come to a place of a little bit of an allowance, a little bit of leeway or flexibility within that overnight parking ban. But I think Councilor Cardino has said over and over, it's not going to solve everybody's individual sort of um, issues, concerns, situations that, that come, in, uh, come about with the, the parking ban in and of itself. College students have had to deal with this for years as well. You know, they had to deal with it last year. You know, they found places to park, quite frankly. Some of them were a little odd in terms of how they came to found places to park. But at the end of the day, they found a place to park. Um, and so uh, you know, this will be, again, a work in progress. Um, we hope that this will solve some issues, though. It won't solve them. Yeah. Plus, all the informational. How you say we shouldn't send a mailer. You drive inside the city every day. There's a big sign there. It says, parking man, winter parking. It was not on my block. <laughs> it's like to me, you go to Elkan every day, you drive by it every day. My, my personal preference, honestly, I mean, it's always at the mayor's discretion, honestly, when the parking ban comes into place. I would like to see it very consistent, though. Even though it might be blazing 65 degree weather out on November 1st, 15th, I think November 15th should be the date. Uh, because then everybody knows that this is the date that it starts. And this is the date that it ends. I mean, it's easier to lift a ban than to put a ban into place, right? If you want to lift the ban earlier, it's a lot easier to do that than to have this kind of nebulous start date of, well, it's still 65. Technically, we're supposed to start on November 15th, but let's see how the weather goes. 
if all the homeowners know know that it's November fifteenth, come um, you know snow or tropical weather, that's the date. And then for folks like yourself, you'll just get used to that particular date. You know, it's November fifteenth. All right. Anything else? I, I believe the, uh, the parking permits, I think that's going to cause more issues than solve. It's going to, I mean, if you're going to have one car on the side of the street and the plaza to go around that, I mean, yeah, I mean, we talked about that earlier, I guess, but. Um. I was just going to respond. <clears throat> you know, I think, again, Councilor Cordino hit it on the head. It is a compromise. I see constituents of mine sitting out here tonight that I've spoken to, and the vast majority of people in my ward are adamantly opposed to any alternate. They wanted a parking ban back. They told me stories about it, saying like since what, and I'm not, not trying to be, you know, I'm not trying to stir the pot here too much, but I, you know, these people told me they've lived here for 50 years, 60 years, you know what it did? People then, people got to know their neighbors and they talked to their neighbors and they, like the college kid would shovel out um, people's house over the winter so they could use that extra spot when the people were gone. I mean, it might even foster a sense of community spirit here, but this compromise, I mean, I think part of this is like, that's the key here is we are trying to you know, compromise and because I personally, 95% of the people in my ward want to have a parking ban straight up. We're trying to accommodate the people in the first ward and around the city. So I mean, I just wanted to throw that back out. You know, I think this is ultimately a compromise. We're doing the best we can with it. Um, one more question. Uh, the municipal uh, parking lots, where are those located? Um, like where, what's the closest one in the city? down to is pretty much what you said in the beginning, that uh, people would need to know what the guidelines and rules are. So as a part of putting the information out, whatever we come up with for a final plan, it certainly would include where those parking places are, municipal parking places. So that would be part of the information we, uh, we send out, whether it's newspaper, uh, whether we send out mailers like you suggested, which might cost us money. Yeah. However, we'll get it out, social media. Any other questions? No, I think that's got it. I uh, appreciate that. Thank you for coming. Anybody else? Howdy. Brett Smith, uh, Third Ward, I believe. Um, I want to thank you guys because you've, you've put some effort forward. I was for the alternate all-day parking, um, but I like that we're doing something and we're moving forward. So thank you on that. Uh, I got my second mailer in the, t in the mail today to uh, fill out a survey about a dog. So I think we can afford a little information, but I definitely agree we need to put it out to everybody. But I, I really do want to commend you guys for doing this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> oh, one more? I was, just, I was just also wondering, um, since a lot of this and my concerns are involving the rentals and the college students, will you put that information in like their student handbook or will you, and when they sign their lease, will that information be in on their lease? So there's more communication I, I between the landlords? Yeah, or? I don't know if there's anything that we could specifically mandate that gets put in the, the college books or whatever else, but I do think, it, particularly like myself, Councilman Reynolds, a little bit Councilman Gozik, who have, you know, college students, I think it's our responsibility to get out to those rental properties, get out to those landowners, advise them of the, the parking regulations so th that they know. Right, because if I was 19, I would not be thinking about alternate parking and is there enough room in the driveway? I would be just thinking about Absolutely. whatever. Well, certainly it's part of our job to get the information out and educate not only the residents, the full-time residents, but also the college students. So when you reach out to the college, I mean, Every college, uh, when you first go to college, they give you a packet with uh, information on where the best restaurants are, where the Walmart is, and all that. It could be a part of a, a welcome uh, to Oswego uh, 
campus. Uh, I have to say, though, as I said before, to me that would be bullet number, choice number three, would be keeping your car here over the winter. Choice number one would be to take it home. Choice number two would be go park in Romney. Choice number three, you know, park at your own risk in whatever parking spot that you have with, attached to your property, honestly. Because I think if we can push college students that way, that's Thank a you. better solution. What, one more over here? Yes. I just have a question. Um, I'm Sue Matthews. I live in Scribe and have property in the city of Oswego. And, um, is, um, the, are you trying to encourage people or are you giving people a choice of permits, whether to apply for a permit to park in public space or alternate parking? What it comes down to is we're, we're putting together a plan. Like you said, there is a parking ban. 12 midnight to 6 a.m. This is in an option where people who can show a need can park on the street using alternate day scheduling. So if you get a permit, you can park on the even side on even day and then that. odd day on, on So the you will no longer be giving permits to park on green space and public space between the sidewalk and the road? No, those, are, those would still be available. We're not eliminating that. So correct. people will have a choice of which way to go. I would think you want them off the road so you can plow. Some people do not have the choice. They cannot park in green space. They have no lawn, no driveway. Right. Not. Well, they have That's to have. To work with. Yeah. They have to have a permit to park in the public green space, though. Correct. Yes. So, and the charges go will be the same as for parking on the road. Yes. Okay. And the only other thing I was confused about is um, in in your plan that you're currently discussing, if. The, the owner of the property owes any money to the city. The tenants will not, they'll be denied their permit to park. Sure. Is that correct? That is correct. So you will be punishing the tenants who already have a bad landlord? Or <laughs> That's one way to look at it. I mean, we, we currently I have on the books uh, where. Didn't you hear any discussion on it. I yes, we currently have on the books where you can't get a building permit if you're the property owner, uh, if you have uh, a water bill that you still owe. Yes, I'm aware of that. Yes, I, I heard. <laughs> so, I mean, that just And goes not hand only hand. people getting flooded are losing their houses, you know. So, but it is correct. Yes, you need to be up, uh, the landlord or the property owner needs to be current. Okay, just wanted to be clear on that. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, this is under old business, so we do have some new business to uh, discuss. So this is your last opportunity to discuss a uh, winter parking plan. Seeing none, time to move on to uh, new business. By the way, thank you, everybody, for uh, contributing and, and sitting here and, and being patient. I appreciate that. Under new business, under authorizations, item number one, the city entered into an agreement with GH. Consulting Engineers, October 15, 2015, perform engineering design and construction services for dewatering equipment replacement at the east side WWTP. The city has now requested to have this project financed through NYSEFC, and NYSEFC requires specific minority and woman owned business goals in the agreement to receive financing. The engineering department requests that the mayor be authorized to sign amendment number one. The engineering agreement with GHD Consulting Engineers to perform engineering design and construction services for the dewatering equipment replacement project at the east side WWTP. Somebody who speaks to that. Now, sir? Yeah, um, the, uh, the requirement for the uh, minority women owned uh, business goal is a requirement of. That's the Environmental Facilities Corporation, ESC, that's what that stands for. Um, 
this is uh, so, I, so that is the requirement to come into compliance with the uh, with the uh, financing that comes through the EU application. So you have to make that available. It doesn't mean that the contract has to be awarded. Didn't know that I needed this, but uh, uh, thanks, Mike. We want you on the public record. Okay. Uh, so the the EFC requirement, as a condition of, of receiving this this funding, uh, requires the minority and women-owned business provision. It doesn't require the city to award a contract to a, a minority or women-owned business, but it has to make this contract available to a minority or women-owned business. There various requirements, but, but the first hurdle, if you will, is to make sure that that language is in the contract. So I'd certainly recommend that, that the council uh, adopt this resolution with that language in it. All right, thank you. I'll make a motion. Uh, Councilor Cordino. Yes. Councilor Van Buren. Yes. Councilor Reynolds. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Councilor Emmons. Yes. Item number two, Michael Riley, purchasing agent. Request authorization for the mayor to sign a renewal agreement with Auctions International and authorize the DPW to list the attached items on Auctions International's website. I don't see Mr. Riley, but uh, there is attachments that we all got uh, that explains uh, that they're uh, looking to uh, auction off uh, some extra vehicles. I see listed here uh, a 2004 Jeep Liberty. Uh, Ford Crown Victoria 2007 2008 2001 Ford F350 pickup 2004 Ford Crown Victoria 2007 Ford Crown Victoria 2003 Ford Expedition four lots of miscellaneous items from the fire department turnout gear boots filing cabinets copier old rotating light bars so it uh, just looks like they're um, just renewing uh, the ability to uh, auction this Motion. Councilor Corradino. Yes. Councilor Van Buren. Yes. Councilor Reynolds. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Councilor Emmons. Yes. Thank you. Item number three. The City Attorney Kevin Caracoli requests authorization to attend a four-day New York State Conference of Mayors Fall Training School for City Officials to be held in Saratoga, New York, on September 12th through the 15th, 2016. Councilor Caracoli. Thank you. Uh, First of all, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Common Council for considering this request. Uh, this is a uh, this is new. Uh, my first uh, year as your city attorney. Uh, I'm not sure what past administrations or or city attorneys availed themselves of this uh, of the NICOM fall training. I know that there are certain uh, employees of the city that that do regularly attend. Um, in speaking with other uh, attorneys in the in the state, some of my colleagues, and and frankly, some other mayors, uh, past and present, uh, they've all encouraged the city to have a regular presence at NICOM. This is an opportunity to do that. Uh, this is a, I believe, it's a five day. Uh, if you count up the days, uh, it's it's actually September 12th through the 16th. I'm only requesting uh, permission to attend from the 12th through the 15th. Uh, the 16th, which is a, a, a Friday, uh, candidly, is um, the only thing on the agenda was breakfast. <laughs> and I, I couldn't, in uh, my, my uh, good conscience, uh, uh, ask that the, that the city consider uh, uh, having me stay overnight to, to attend a breakfast uh, meeting. I just didn't see any value in that. So it would be uh, essentially from Monday uh, through uh, hotel, Monday through through Wednesday with a Thursday checkout, I believe, after the, the last sessions on Thursday. There are a number of uh, topics that are of particular interest to the city of Oswego, and, and I look forward to reporting back on that. Uh, one final note um, is that uh, there is, uh, typically, as I understand it, mileage is, is, uh, is sought uh, for reimbursement. I'm not seeking any, any mileage uh, reimbursement. Um, I'm simply asking that the city consider the, the cost of the registration fee, which is $295. And then the, uh, the meals are actually included as the price of the, of the hotel and the, and the conference itself. And um, 
the uh, the nightly conference uh, hotel and meal, uh, I believe, is get this correct. It's uh, two. Two eighty-five uh, for for member. Um, so that is the uh, that's the request. Some of the topics uh, that's in your packet for uh, for public uh, consumption. However, uh, there are lots of training on uh, on open meetings law, uh, FOIL requests, uh, which we certainly get a lot of. Uh, there's um, water and sewer administration. Uh, there's a particular interest uh, to me, understanding the public officer's law, property tax uh, matters, which uh, part of the reason for, for me having a, an increased presence at City Hall was to take on the tax certiorari proceedings. I can tell you in 2016 we've, we've been inundated with a number of them, primarily commercial. We have a few property uh, uh, challenges to our, to our tax assessment, but it's always good to, uh, to get uh, you know, refreshers on, on that. Um, so any other questions or topics? There's a, there's a topic on zombie properties, which is of particular interest and I think is, is a timely topic for the city. Um, and uh, just, you know, general management of, of city government. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to, to answer them, but uh, I do, uh, again, appreciate your consideration. I just want to point out one thing uh, that uh, I had never heard of NICOM until I became a counselor, and uh, this is a, a great uh, association, a great organization to be a part of. Uh, I took advantage of uh, a number of web, uh, webinars uh, that uh, kind of brought me up to speed. It was a crash course on how to be a counselor. Uh, so I know they offer many services, uh, legal, uh, uh, some other uh, types of advice. I know they speak very highly uh, of the organization. Uh, maybe you want to share some of your experiences. Uh, yeah, I attended uh, once when I was doing the Riley Water Tank Project just in the beginning. Mayor Gillen and I went down for a three-day conference they had in the winter. Uh, they're great. Uh, Wade Beltramo specifically puts on some really fantastic uh, classes. His webinars are great. He's more geared towards zoning and stuff like that, but he does a really nice job. If you guys have any questions about that. Uh, during the first round of taxi cab legislation stuff, I relied pretty heavily on NICOM to kind of see me through some of the hurdles there. So they're fantastic. If you guys have questions about codes or things like that that you want to change or uh, grant op opportunities, those type of things, they're a really good resource. Uh, case law specifically, if you're looking for something that might be an issue for the city, they have all of our municipal codes for cities in general on file and they can help you out and they can look them up really quickly and know what you need. Uh, so I would recommend getting on there and getting involved with them. They're a great organization. Thank you. Any other uh, questions, concerns? I'll make Anything a motion. Councilor Corradino. Yes. Councilor Van Buren. Councilor Reynolds. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Councilor Emmons. Yes. That was uh, the last item on the agenda uh, at this point. Any other questions, issues, concerns? Seeing none. Back. Councilor Corradino. Yes. Councilor Van Buren. Yes. Councilor Reynolds. Councilor Walker. Yes. Councilor Emmons. Yes. Yeah.